So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this workshop today. I'm very excited to talk about the work that we've been doing to make machine learning more trustworthy. Before I start, I want to acknowledge that this work was done in collaboration with many others, including my students, and I'll try to acknowledge the names of the collaborators at the bottom of slides uh, when that is relevant. Otherwise, I encourage you to check out my website for, to find all of this work, uh, as well as pointers to my collaborators' websites. So when I took a look at the topics for today's workshop, um, I was excited to see that there are a lot of opportunities in participatory ML to help with uh, trustworthy ML. So in particular today, I'll come back on three of these topics. So how do we build interactive ML? How do we abstain when we can't trust machine learning predictions? And how we build better auditing approaches. So you will see these themes uh, throughout my presentation today. Uh, and I hope that this will spur interest in, in the intersection between these different fields. So what do I mean by trustworthy machine learning? Um, I think it encompasses a lot of uh, different fields and subfields, uh, one of which is studying the integrity of machine learning systems when they face adversaries. So we've seen a lot of work on poisoning and adversarial examples where the adversary is manipulating the data uh, that is the input of the machine learning system either at training time for poisoning or at test time for adversarial examples. When there are no adversaries, we've seen uh, topics like safety, where here the idea is to understand the worst case behavior of our system. Um, for instance, if we think about autonomous driving, we'd like to know how our car will behave uh, as the lighting conditions change uh, throughout the day. Uh, another theme is, is privacy, where the idea is to look at how well we can protect sensitive information contained in the training set of machine learning systems uh, while still having utility from, from the learning procedure. And then uh, there is a whole array of, of uh, topics around the ethics of, of doing machine learning. And today I'll come back on a specific uh, example of uh, deep fakes. So I think the, the first step that uh, we, we need to achieve is to define what we mean by trustworthy machine learning. So in the previous slide, I gave examples of areas where uh, trust in machine learning system is being built by looking at specific uh, attack vectors. Uh, now, when, when we choose one of them, so let's say, for instance, adversarial examples, if we want to make progress towards achieving uh, a model that we can uh, trust in being robust to adversarial examples, we need to first define what is uh, robustness uh, under these uh, these conditions. And so in, in the community, we, we started by looking at a toy problem uh, of defining the robustness of a machine learning system using LP norms. So the idea is that you will have training points and you expect your model uh, to be a constant predictor around the training points within an LP ball. So this is uh, the reason for this definition was, I think, motivated by the fact that at the time, models were very sensitive to uh, small perturbations according to the LP norms uh, when, when the adversaries manipulated the test inputs. And so the idea here is to make them less sensitive to these uh, perturbations. So you can see on the left, we have a model where the training image is here, and we're asking the model to be constant here because the real decision boundary, the solid line, uh, is not uh, the same than the uh, model's decision boundary, which is the dotted red line. And so here in this space, we have uh, adversarial examples that are very close to the training point. So when we uh, make progress towards achieving robustness according to this definition, and we've seen a lot of work on certified robustness to adversarial examples that have come up with techniques to do that, um, we get models like this, where now we've achieved a model that is constant around the training point within this uh, LP bowl. So the new boundary that the model has learned is here. Uh, but it's still not the boundary that we expected, the ideal boundary here, which remains this uh, solid line. And so what this means is that this test image here of a five, which is very close according to uh, the LP norm to the uh, training image here of the three, is now classified as a three, whereas the original model correctly classified it as a five. And so what we see here is that there is a mismatch between uh, what we intended it uh, to achieve, which is to have a model that makes the correct predictions on all of its inputs, and so that has robustness uh, to these uh, test time perturbations, and the property that we uh, trained the model to achieve, which is robustness to LP norms. And so this, this really begs the question of 
how can we design uh, training algorithms that will support trust in the long term uh, while escaping this arms race? Because what, what happens here, uh, if we come back to this example, is that now we have new ways of finding adversarial examples against this model, and these adversarial examples exploit the excessive invariance that we've hard-coded in our model by training it to be robust to LP norms uh, adversarial examples. So this is a result actually that uh, Joran Jakobson and our collaborators presented uh, this week at ICMO. So what can we do in the long term? The question is really, can we avoid an arms race where we find uh, a first class of adversarial examples that we define using this LP norm, then we are able to defend against them by uh, increasing the robustness of the model, but then we come up with new attacks uh, that exploit uh, a new vulnerability, which is the successive invariance, which you could defend against, and so on, come up with another attack. Well, this is really uh, something that happens in, in the practical world where uh, you, you have to balance sort of the cost of the protection and the risk that you're facing from uh, a loss. So for instance, if you have a house, uh, you will use a lock to prevent people from entering your home, but that's not going to prevent a bear from uh, breaking through your uh, window. And so this is sort of the approach that we've uh, used in traditional computer systems uh, of having this balance between how much we spend on protecting and how much we risk losing. But if we do this, we, we are always in, a, in an arms race. So the question uh, is really for machine learning, can we do something different? And can we achieve uh, trustworthy machine learning uh, in a way that is uh, principled and that will not suffer from this arms race? And I think machine learning is sufficiently different in the paradigm that it offers uh, that we do have a uh, hope to achieve trustworthiness without entering this, this arms race. And one of the reasons is that machine learning is in some ways very similar to uh, what has uh, led to the, to the success of cryptography, uh, where it is very easy to express a lot of the components of machine learning systems uh, using mathematical concepts. And so that makes it easier to reason about some of its properties. So let me give you an example of a success story. So this is a little bit different aspect of trustworthiness, where now we're, we're talking about the privacy um, of, of the machine learning system. And so here the idea is uh, that a lot of the community has converged towards this definition of privacy called differential privacy, which is really able to align what we think as humans means privacy with what we can actually implement in machine learning systems. Uh, and so the idea is to say my algorithm, so here my training procedure is private, if its outputs are indistinguishable to an adversary uh, observing the algorithm behaving in two settings. The first setting is one where the data included the data of a particular individual. So this is the setting at the top. The second setting is where the data did not include the data of that specific individual. What that means is an adversary uh, that is observing our algorithm cannot tell whether this person existed or did not exist. And so by definition cannot learn anything that is private about this person. So how do we do this in machine learning? Well, we, we came up with an approach called Pate. Uh, there are other approaches like uh, differentially private stochastic graded descent, but I'm going to just introduce this one very quickly because it makes it easy to see why differential privacy is, is a successful definition and is a step towards trustworthy machine learning. Um, so here the idea is you have a sensitive training set and rather than training an entire uh, model on this entire data set, you're going to split the data set in multiple partitions and then train an ensemble of teachers on each of these uh, partitions. So what this means is uh, because the data has no overlap between the partitions, each of these models, each of the teachers are trained independently to solve the same task. And then we can aggregate their predictions uh, and introduce a little bit of noise uh, to make the whole uh, prediction of the whole ensemble uh, differentially private. What happens is that we ask each of the teachers to vote for a prediction uh, and then we build a histogram of, of votes, we perturb this histogram, uh, and then we take the argmax. What this means in practice is that if uh, your data was included in the original data set, it's only included in one of the partitions and can only influence one of the teachers. What that means is that if the, the overall ensemble is making a prediction, then there is very little chance that you're impacting the outcome of this prediction because you will only in impact one of the votes among the n votes that were made uh, and used to build the histogram that is uh, the basis for the uh, aggregated prediction. And what's interesting here is that the 
predictions of the ensemble that are more likely to be private are the ones where it is easier to uh, perturb the histogram of votes. What that means is that there is a very strong consensus among the teachers and so all of them vote or almost all of them vote for the same class. But what that means is that this uh, notion of privacy is very well aligned with generalization because if all of the teachers vote for the same class it means that a lot of models made independently the same prediction from different uh, training data sets. And so this is how you can see that there's this really interesting synergy between privacy uh, and uh, generalization in machine learning. This really explains why differential privacy is, has been successful in machine learning, is that unlike uh, the definition of robustness to adversarial examples, uh, which uh, relies on the LP norm and conflicts with generalization, as you saw in the previous example, when you have robustness to LP norms, you're directly asking the model to uh, learn a decision boundary that directly conflicts with making the correct prediction. Instead, with differential privacy, when you train a model with differential privacy, you're directly encouraging generalization. So differential privacy is a worst case uh, guarantee that uh, implies generalization. And so there's no trade-off that's necessary between privacy and what we're trying to do with machine learning. And uh, we have a smooth degradation of not being able to learn when we cannot do it with privacy. So there is this really nice alignment between the concept of the human norm, which is privacy, and the goal of the machine learning system, which is to generalize. And so I think this is really why uh, we've been a lot more successful at, at achieving differential privacy in machine learning than building machine learning systems that are robust to adversarial examples. So taking a step back, what does this mean for uh, machine learning to be trustworthy? I think at training time, uh, and I'm going to repeat this message, is we really need definitions uh, that align machine learning systems with human norms. Uh, and so here, the example I give of differential privacy is I think an example where the community has uh, achieved uh, success in the sense that the definition of privacy uh, aligns with uh, sort of the human norms that would fall under the umbrella of the term privacy. However, it's, it's, it remains an open problem to find equivalent definitions uh, for other norms. And so if you remember the first uh, slide of my presentation, there are lots of aspects of trustworthy machine learning, and we haven't found the right definitions for each of these. And so that means that there is a lot of uh, open problems of what we define, what does it mean for a system to be safe, for instance. And sometimes it's going to be really hard to come up with these definitions because we as humans don't always know how to express these norms and how we make specific decisions. And so this is really, I think, an interesting open problem as to how we can better align machine learning uh, with human norms. However, it doesn't mean that we will uh, just need to accept failure if we're not able uh, to come up with these definitions uh, that will uh, drive uh, training algorithms to produce machine learning systems that align with human norms. When we fail to uh, completely align uh, machine learning systems, we need solutions at test time uh, to mitigate some of the ne negative consequences that are going to uh, be necessary. And so here I'm going to give three examples, uh, but just to be clear, there are many other directions that uh, we could pursue. The first one is uh, what I'll call admission control. And the idea here is very close to abstaining as uh, included in one of the topics of the workshop where we want to put the machine learning system in a sandbox and decide what are the acceptable inputs and outputs. The second idea is auditing. Right? So we don't really have a good understanding of uh, what we should re record as the machine learning is being trained and as the machine learning is making predictions to uh, have a complete compromise recording uh, throughout the lifetime of the machine learning system. And so that means that it's difficult once we do learn of a compromise or a failure of the machine learning system to come back and try to understand what, uh, what caused this, this failure. And the third, the third direction that I see is the one of governance, where the idea is to figure out throughout the lifetime of a machine learning system, how do we address some of the limitations once we've identified them? So how do we uh, come back to the machine learning model and uh, patch it essentially once we found some of the limitations that it has. And so in the remainder of the time that I have today, I'm going to uh, talk in more details on uh, two approaches. The first one uh, is about admission control and the second one is for model governance. So here the idea is really, when do we decide to abstain from making a prediction when, when I'm talking about admission control at test time? One way to achieve at least uh, this, this uh, property of being able to abstain is to have a measure of uncertainty in the machine learning model's predictions. But it's really hard to come up with metrics uh, that estimate the uncertainty of the prediction 
but that are well calibrated uh, and able to uh, reject outliers uh, despite an adversary actively manipulating the inputs to try and uh, mislead the, the model into having very high confidence. And in fact, we've seen uh, with adversarial examples that we can sort of arbitrarily control the confidence of the model. So here the idea is uh, that we've been exploring with several collaborators is uh, to uh, tie back the notion of uncertainty to the training data of the model. And so uh, in, in an approach called the deep K nearest neighbors, the idea is to say, let's take a deep neural network and sort of open up the black box. And rather of thinking of uncertainty as something that we have to look at the level of the full model, is to break it apart in smaller problems and look at individual layers and look at the representation that they out output of the data. And so the idea is, is the following. If we have a test input, we're going to look at how each layer represents this test input. And in each of the layers representation space, we're going to perform a nearest neighbor search. So for instance, in the first layer here, we have the test point here, which is the green, air, uh, the green cross. And all of these images are, ex are training examples and how this layer represents these training examples. And so here, what we're saying is we have uh, in this representation space, the test image is closest to training images that correspond to the panda category. Uh, then we move to the next layer and we have a little bit more abstract representation. Again, we repeat this nearest neighbor search uh, and so on until we reach the last layer of the model. And so as we progress through the architecture, we are going to identify a set of uh, training points that have closest representations in each of the layers uh, representation spaces. And because these are training images, we have both the input and the label for them. And so we can look at the labels of these nearest neighbors. And what we observed is that when the model is uh, confident in its prediction, the labels of the nearest neighbors in each of these representation spaces are going to be consistent with the prediction that the model is making. And so what this implies is that the model has support in its training data for making uh, the prediction that it's making. On the other hand, when the model is making a prediction that is wrong because it lacks the support from the training data, the labels of the nearest neighbors that we find in each of the different layers are going to be inconsistent uh, with the prediction that the model is making. So for instance here, you can see that initially the, the model is uh, projecting the image uh, in, in a cluster of training points that are from the correct class, but as we move up layers, uh, the image is gradually projected first in an ambiguous portion of the representation space with both classes, and then in uh, uh, a cluster of points from the wrong class. And so we can analyze the labels of the nearest neighbors uh, to predict uh, not only the label, but also how, how much support there is in this label. And so we use a, a framework of conformal prediction uh, to output a well-calibrated estimate of uncertainty. One interesting uh, question that this brings is, are there objectives that we can define at the level of each layer to make models more amenable to these types of uh, test time analysis? And, and so this is what we looked at in a follow-up work from last year's ICML called the soft nearest neighbor loss, where uh, the idea was to say, is it better for the model to learn uh, representation spaces that separate the data from different classes with a large margin, as you would imagine, sort of the intuition behind a support vector machine? Or is it better to entangle different classes together within the hidden representations that the deep neural network is learning? And so surprisingly, what we found is that the latter is better uh, for uh, this deep K nearest neighbors to estimate the uncertainty of the model. So we introduced the soft nearest neighbor loss, which is uh, basically encouraging the model to entangle points from different classes in the hidden representations of, of its architecture. But then we have another penalty in our loss, which of course uh, encourages the model uh, to separate the classes at the very last uh, layer before it makes a prediction. And so what happens is that the soft nearest neighbor loss that we add is going to encourage the model uh, to basically co-opt features between different classes in the lower layers, right? So different classes might, uh, might be able to be uh, recognized using the same lower level features. And so we're encouraging the model um, to, to, to do that in the lower uh, layers. And this in turn helps us uh, estimate uncertainty because rather than having very well separated clusters where when we have a test point that doesn't fall in any of these clusters, we're sort of making guesses about what its nearest neighbors are. Now we have uh, a lot more support when we're doing the nearest neighbor search 
because the different classes are entangled when it's hard uh, to separate them. So, so this was one example of, of uh, how do we abstain when uh, making predictions. The second topic that I wanted to cover before I run out of time is how do we achieve model governance? And so here, this is, this is one instance of how do we make machine learning more interactive uh, with inputs from users. So this is a different problem. The idea is to say, so now we've noticed that our uh, model has a limitation. So for instance, we may have noticed that we had points that were poisoned uh, during training, or simply some of the users come back to us and say, uh, I previously agreed to share my data, but now I want to revoke this access, so I'd like you to delete all, all of your uh, data that you stored about me. Uh, so this is something that's been sort of put forward in a lot of legal frameworks in uh, the European Union, uh, California, and, and Canada. So now the question is, how do we patch the models that we've trained on these data sets uh, and that are probably already deployed? And so we put forward this notion of machine unlearning. So go, and go back to these models and unlearn what they've extracted from, from the training data points that we now have to remove. And so the, the first question you can ask yourself is really, isn't differential privacy uh, enough to, to prevent us from having to do machine unlearning? And, and the, the answer is not really because uh, essentially what differential privacy is going to tell us is that the contribution of each training point is bounded, right? So we know that there is a limit to how much we can learn from each training example. But instead, if we want to uh, basically remove the need for uh, doing any form of machine unlearning, we would have to make sure that none of the training examples that we want to unlearn had any impact on the model. So that would basically require uh, indifferential privacy to have a bound uh, on epsilon that is zero. Right? And so that means that we cannot learn anything from any of the training points. And so this is why the, the notion of machine unlearning is, is different from what we uh, studied in differential privacy and how it applies to machine learning. So why is this machine unlearning so difficult? Well, the reason is that it's really hard to, uh, it's not only hard to bound the influence of each training example, it's also really hard to estimate how much each training example will influence your parameters and even predictions. Um, and, and so this makes it difficult to, to know which uh, parameters of your model were impacted by any specific training example that you want to unlearn. The second reason is that there's a lot of stochasticity in, in training things like deep neural networks, uh, where you sample mini batches, uh, the learning itself has multiple minima, and training the procedures are incremental. If you look at stochastic gradient descent, once you've used one point in one of your updates, all of the following updates will depend on that point. And so it's really hard to trace back the contributions of one training example to the, to the model that you output and deploy. To define really what we want to achieve through machine unlearning, it's useful to, to think about it in terms of the distributions of models that our training procedure uh, will output. And what we want to achieve is basically to be able to tell the user that if we've unlearned the, their data, the model that we obtain through the unlearning procedure should have been possible to obtain in the first place without their data. What this means is we train with their data, we obtain a model, then we unlearn and obtain a second model. And we could have obtained the second model without their data in the first place. And so this is a very strict definition uh, and it makes it, it puts a lot of constraints on how we design the unlearning procedure. And so the way that uh, we, we achieve this, this definition of unlearning in, in a paper that's to appear at uh, next year's Symposium on Security and Privacy uh, is through a, a strategy called uh, CISA, which stands for Sharded, Isolated, Sliced, Aggregated Trading. So the idea here, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at this diagram, is to have uh, two, two improvements over sort of the naive way of training a model. The first one is to shard its data into uh, multiple partitions. So here, each of the shards is th this set of rectangles. And then we've, within each shard, we're going to further divide the data in slices. And so these are the uh, individual rectangles that you see here. And then the idea is to train, rather than train a model on the entire data set, we train a model on each of the shards. But the model that is trained on each of the shards does not see all of the data included in the shards starting from the first epoch. Initially, the model is going to only see data that is contained in the first slice of uh, the corresponding shard. So the model is going to start training. And then the, the model is going to be presented after a few epochs with the second slice of data. And so the model is going to continue training now on uh, data that includes both the first and the second slice. But before we introduce the second slice, we're going to save a checkpoint 
Uh, so we're going to s save the state of the model um, before we start training on the second slice. And then we're going to train on the first, second, and third slice, and again, save a checkpoint before we introduce the third slice, and so on until we've seen all of the data in the shard. What this means is that once we've deployed the model and someone comes back to us and say, I'd like to unlearn this uh, data point, then the data point is only going to be in one of the shards and in one of the slices within that shard. What that means is that rather than train from scratch a model on the entire data set, we only need to retrain one of the uh, individual shard models here. And what that also means is that training that individual model is going to be faster because if uh, the point is not in the first slice um, of the shard, what this means is that we can revert the model back to the last state that we saved before we analyzed the slice that contains the point to be unlearned. And then we can resume training from that. And so that will save us also some retraining time. And so it, you, can, you can check the papers for details, uh, but the, the idea here is, is, is simple, but it lets you um, retrain models uh, to unlearn specific points uh, at a, a smaller cost uh, in terms of computation. All right, so this, this sort of concludes uh, what I wanted to, to discuss about uh, sort of achieving trustworthy machine learning through technology. And so the idea here is at training time, we need research that aligns machine learning with human norms. And so I gave examples of how we were not able to achieve this uh, to have integrity in the face of adversarial examples, but how we were able to achieve this uh, to have a notion of privacy. And at test time, I showed how approaches to uh, participatory ML can address some of the limitations uh, that will occur uh, and result from uh, imperfections in the alignment that's done at training time. So I, I gave examples of how to abstain uh, with the deep nearest neighbors or how to have this notion of governance through something like unlearning where you can manage the model uh, throughout its uh, life cycle. But before I conclude, I want to make one last point, which is that technology is not going to be enough, and we're going to have to complement it with legal frameworks and education. Uh, and so this is, this is work that we did in the context of deep fakes, uh, but I think it's important to understand sort of the broader picture here uh, as, we, as we do research on machine learning. So the problem of deep fakes uh, that I'm going to talk about is really related to forgery, and there's a long history uh, of forgery, so in, in the 1700s, uh, letters were being forged, so there's an example of George Washington uh, stating that we shouldn't fight the British uh, in a faked letter. Uh, in the 1990s, we had a lot of uh, progress with things like Photoshop to edit images. So now we were able to edit both uh, text, letters, and images. And now in the, uh, in, in the recent years, we've made a lot of progress on generative modeling that has made it possible to edit videos. And so really, here the idea is that progress in machining is accelerating uh, the process of digital alteration uh, that will lead to, uh, make, to make it easier basically to forge any sort of uh, human discourse. And so what do we do about this? So we, we could think about approaches that are sort of based on technology. You could try to detect some of the artifacts that are introduced in deepfakes. Uh, so for instance, in uh, deepfakes that uh, are basically doing some face swapping, there, there are some imperfections, uh, for instance, in the body movements that uh, previous work has shown you can identify. Um, the, the problem here is that as we build better detectors, we're likely to improve the generation process itself because that's the very way that a lot of the generative models are trained, where in things like GANs, you have a generator that is trained against a discriminator that is basically uh, serving the purpose of detecting uh, images or videos that are fake. And so this means in the short term, what we're going to achieve is something very similar to signature-based malware detection, where we're able to identify sort of the known attacks, the known deepfakes generation uh, models. But in the long term, we're just going to uh, see something where the progress in generation is going to outpace the progress in detection. Uh, and so unfortunately, this does not seem like a viable long-term uh, solution. A second approach that we could, we could think of with technology is to say, well, we could have provenance and, and record all of the entities and systems that manipulated uh, videos that we're producing. So this is, this is possible. There, there are projects like the Gordon Project that have put forward applications like Proof Mode to help people do that. The long-term problem here is there is, there is going to be uh, issues with creating keys, distributing keys, 
uh, as we've seen in certificates uh, for websites on the internet. Uh, and there are questions of how do we post-process content. So some, some, some of the modifications are legitimate. For instance, if you have a video and you want to show it on TV, you might have to modify some of the videos. Uh, you could also attack this, this providence uh, system by having uh, a, a video recording of uh, sort of a video playing on, on a computer screen. And so if the video is recording using a camera that has the providence uh, mechanism, then you would be able to evade sort of this, this uh, detection mechanism. And, and then the third solution is a little bit more drastic, which is to say, well, I'm going to record every minute of my life. So the reason why this is not a good solution here is, is privacy, because of course, uh, we might not want to recreate our own version of the Truman Show. So what this really drives at is that there, there are two answers to this question. There is science and policy. And the, the technology solutions that I've uh, gone over very quickly are not going to provide all of the answers to, to the problem that's created uh, by generative models. We need to complement those with uh, policy. And so here, the, some of the difficulties are that humans are going to seek to reinforce their opinions. And it's sometimes very hard to find unbiased information that can help us um, break sort of our bubbles. But the key is to find uh, policy, legal, and normative frameworks that will help us manage the negative uses of technology uh, in conjunction with efforts that I just presented to improve the technology itself uh, and make it less vulnerable to, to these uh, manipulations. And so I think there's uh, a lot of opportunities here and in the, in the paper uh, that is cited at the bottom of the slide, we go over uh, a lot of these possible uh, ways to move forward. Some, some examples include having improved legislation to, to establish criminal penalties for, for the use of deepfakes, uh, but also involving different actors. So platforms that are hosting uh, some of the content could, could help with having better feedback loops uh, and clear principles as to what is acceptable on the platform. Um, and also you could, you could see improved education, right? Uh, integrating ethics as part of uh, engineering education uh, will most likely uh, help in the future having uh, technologies that are designed with negative consequences of the technology being one of the factors that is considered at uh, design time when coming up with, with the technology. So to conclude, I'd like to just finish on this optimistic note, which is that trustworthy machine learning is an opportunity to make machine learning better. And we've seen with uh, things like privacy preserving machine learning that we can produce machine learning systems that are not only more respectful, uh, but also that perform better, that journalize better. Um, and so this is really exciting because we have a very constructive outcome rather than uh, trying to constrain the progress of, of the technology. So with this, uh, I'll take any questions that you have uh, offline. I'm, I'm available by email. Um, and I just pointed here at a couple of resources that I recommend you check out. Uh, so cleverons.io is, uh, for instance, a blog where we discuss a lot of these uh, issues in, in more details. So thanks for listening.